This video will introduce you to hepatitis A. Hepatitis A is a disease that affects the liver that's caused by a virus. It is spread to the fecal oral route. Symptoms of hepatitis A include headache, fever, jaundice, which is the yellowing of skin and eyes, fatigue, dark colored urine, light or clay colored stools, some of, sometimes can be diarrhea, weight loss, and abdominal pain. Approximately 30% of children under the age of six won't have any symptoms at all. On average, Arizona sees about 61 cases of hepatitis A each year. Hepatitis A has a long incubation period. It can be as short as 15 days or as long as 50 days, but it's usually around one month. Cases of hepatitis A are infectious for two weeks before their symptoms begin, which can make outbreak management really challenging. If a case does have jaundice, they're infectious for one week after their jaundice onset. If they don't have jaundice, they're infectious two weeks after onset. The only type of lab result that can make a case of hepatitis A is an IgM positive. If you find that a person with an IgM positive result doesn't have any symptoms, this might indicate an asymptomatic infection, a false positive, or a previous infection where the IgM is still elevated after the illness has resolved. An IgG positive results means someone has been vaccinated and has immunity, or they've been infected in the past. Once someone is infected with hepatitis A, they're immune for life. Sometimes you'll see an antibody test, which detects both IgM and IgG antibodies, but doesn't distinguish between the two of them. This is called a total antibody test. Because this lab test is unclear about which is creating positive results, Total antibody test results are not always not a case and do not need to be investigated. Now I'll talk about liver function tests, which is part of the hepatitis A case definition. IgM positive is detectable in serum about five to 10 days before symptom onset and declines to undetectable levels within six months after infection. Sometimes people test positive for IgM up to a year after the infection has been reported. About 20% of people who have been vaccinated will develop an IgM response, and this is what can create a false positive result. In addition to a positive IgM result, a person must have marked liver involvement in order to meet the case definition. This means they can either have jaundice, which is the yellowing of eyes and skin, or they can have elevated liver function tests. The requirements have changed in 2019. So liver enzymes are considered elevated if the ALT is over 200 or the total bilirubin is over 3. Elevated AST is no longer part of the case definition. So in order to be a confirmed case, they must be IgM positive, have symptoms of hepatitis, and have either jaundice or elevated liver function tests. If you're interviewing a case and find out that they know someone who has hepatitis A symptoms, those contacts are considered confirmed cases even without lab testing. They should also be investigated just like those with lab results. The only way a case will be marked probable is if they are IgM positive and there is no symptom information available. However, this means we should have very few probable cases because obtaining medical records should help you determine whether or not this person was symptomatic. There is no suspect case definition for cases of hepatitis A. The good news about hepatitis A is that there is a vaccine. The vaccine was licensed in 1995 and is now recommended for all children beginning at age one. Because there's a large group of adults who may not have received the vaccine, it's recommended for all those at heightened risk, including people who travel internationally, men who have sex with men, those who use recreational drugs, people with unstable housing, and those experiencing homelessness people with chronic liver conditions, such as hepatitis B or C, and those with clotting disorders. This vaccine series consists of two doses given six months apart. Now I wanna talk about some of the investigation steps for cases of hepatitis A. Step one is to check the case definition with the labs and the clinical information. There are a lot of erroneous labs entered into MedSys, so double check that you need to call this case. Step two is to interview the cases from their risk factors and where they may have been exposed. Often you'll find the people are 
infected during international travel to an area where hepatitis A is endemic. This includes Mexico. You'll want to ask about whether they were around anyone who was sick with similar symptoms in the months before they came ill. Hepatitis A can be spread through household contact, caregiving, health care, or by sick individuals who prepare food for others. Hepatitis A can also be spread through sexual contact, especially in, among men who have sex with men. There are questions about sexual partners on the standard questionnaire. A risk factor that's been more and more common in the past few years is the use of illicit drugs. People who use either injection or non-injection drugs are at heightened risk for contracting this illness. We want to make sure that you know that it's not the drug use itself that makes people be at risk. It's really the community, the close contact, and the lack of hygiene. Closely related to ongoing outbreaks among people who use drugs, those with unstable housing or those experiencing homelessness are also at risk. We can't forget about foodborne illness when it comes to hepatitis A. Historically, frozen berries, including strawberries, pomegranate seeds, and others have been implicated in outbreaks. You should also ask about fresh produce like leafy greens and tomatoes. Foods that are not cooked or considered ready to eat are at higher risk of contamination with hepatitis A and other enteric pathogens. And finally, seafood has been contaminated with hepatitis A on a number of occasions, including in shrimp, crab, and trout. And the same with all enteric interviews, you're strongly encouraged to go off script and ask about social situations, such as their work, their activities outside of work, and any other questions that are not on the questionnaire. Sometimes allowing for unstructured conversation can lead to important investigation discoveries. The third step for assessing for, is assessing for contacts who may be at risk for becoming sick from the case as well. People with hepatitis A are infectious two weeks before their symptom onset and one week after the onset of jaundice. If they don't have jaundice, then they're considered infectious for two weeks after onset. If it is determined that there are people who are in contact with the case, they may be eligible for post-exposure prophylaxis, or PEP. This is a single-dose antigen hepatitis A vaccine, or immune globulin, which is called Ig, that if, it, if administered within two weeks of the last exposure to someone to, with hepatitis A can prevent them from developing the illness. People who are at the highest risk would be those who definitely shared a very close space with the case. This would be people in the same household, sexual contacts, sharing a room with the day, same daycare, those who may have shared or used drugs together, and those who are at high risk for becoming very ill with, with hepatitis A or even dying from it. Those at lower risk should be considered for PEP on a case-by-case -case basis, including individuals with whom the case had more casual contact. This is people they may have spent time with, such as friends, those they share a large work or gym space with, and others who had moderate contact with the case. Finally, those who had very minimal contact are unlikely to need PEP. If you do determine that you have contacts who are eligible for PEP, it's critical that you double check their vaccine history. This is because folks who have been vaccinated are not recommended to receive PEP because the hepatitis A vaccine is really good. People who are immunocompromised are always suggested to get Ig rather than vaccine as PEP. And finally, those who are healthy have different recommendations based upon their age group, either Ig or vaccine. And even if you find someone who is in a close contact who is eligible for PEP, they should still be encouraged to receive the, the vaccine to prevent future illnesses. And the last investigation step is to exclude this person if necessary. So cases or contacts who are symptomatic who work in a healthcare setting providing direct medical care those who work in any kind of food service, and those who attend or are employed by childcare should be excluded until they are no longer deemed infectious. To wrap up the steps of investigating cases of hepatitis A, you have to understand your lab results and, and confirm whether it's a real infection. Understand that determining exposures is going to help you determine not only where the case became infected, but prevent future illnesses and outbreaks. And finally, you want to identify those contacts so that you can provide PEP and stop immediate and future spread. 
Here is a summary of the timelines that serve to make hepatitis A cases just a little bit confusing. But if you ever have questions or need any assistance with hepatitis A cases, you can always reach out to ADHS for help. Thanks.